English and Spanish interpretation, but we are having some small trouble on these both channels. So uh, we hope we can solve this very soon. I can hear myself actually. Okay, are the others hearing me twice? No. Okay. So. Yeah. In the lower part of your uh, screens, you should be able to choose the interpretation channel you prefer, rather English or Spanish. Uh, it's uh, an, an icon of a, a globe uh, that you can set for your preference uh, language. So as I, as I was saying, we are two organizers of this session. I am part of Engineers Without Borders. Uh, we are an NGO that was born 30 years ago. We are fighting for the right to energy and water at the global level, trying to uh, place the affected communities, the affected people at the center of the question. Um, and I'm going also to introduce Roland from Transform Europe to introduce the other organization co-organizing. Yeah, good morning, uh, all of you. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for joining uh, our event this morning. Yeah, I'm based in Brussels. I work for Transform Europe uh, here in Brussels. Uh, Transform Europe is an organization, uh, is, a, is a member organization. We have more uh, than uh, 35 organizations which are members observers in Europe um, in more than uh, 20 European countries. So focusing on political education, scientific analysis, etc. So um, this is really a great honor uh, to be allowed uh, to take part as a co-organizer with uh, uh, you all here at this forum. I've taken part yesterday uh, in the forum in Brussels, and it was just amazing to see the expertise. Um, so I'm really glad that you are all there. And I'm uh, very honored uh, to have been able to co-organize this session with Monica. So uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks. Great. Thank you so much. So uh, we are going to start with interventions. First of all, I want to remember that uh, the channel for comments and questions will be open during all the session. Uh, we want it to be an interactive session. Uh, you can leave your comments. You can leave also interesting links that can be of use for others participating. Uh, and also, you can write your name if you want to uh, have the floor uh, when the debate starts after the interventions. And Roland will be kindly writing all the names down. And then also, we will be giving you the floor. So, with further ado, we will start and uh, I have the pleasure to present the first panelist which is Maria Matias. Maria is member of the European Parliament for the Portuguese Party Bloco in the European Parliament. She is a full member in the Committee of Industry, Research and Energy and also in the Committee for Foreign Relations. She is one of the responsible parliamentarians of the campaign of the left group Power to the People which pushes for people and climate-oriented transformation of the EU energy system. So, Marisa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope, hope that my connection is a little bit better now when we were doing the test. I realized that it was not okay. I changed rooms, so hopefully it will work. Thank you for the invitation. I think it's quite important, all the events that have been organized in this week, because energy policy is a core at core of our, our um, concerns and uh, so I'll use my few minutes of introduction just to talk a little bit about our campaign. As you said, I'm one of the members of the left group engaged in the Power to the People campaign. The other two members are Connie Ernst from Die Linke, Germany and Cira Rego from Izquierda Unida, Spain. So we started this campaign um, uh, already 
a long time ago. I mean, uh, we started in the moment that the prices of energy started to be to increase, and uh, before even before the invasion of Ukraine by by Russia. So of course things changed a little bit after the war, uh, but uh, in any case, we always repeat the same issue, which is uh, the the fact that uh, it, the the right rising prices on energy and the problems that we are living were not caused by the war. Uh, they were already there because of the model that we have. So in our campaign, we try to deal with all the dimensions and especially those that the European Union can do something in order to act. And, uh, and unfortunately, the answers are not there too much. So we started our campaign by the fact that in the European Union, we have uh, what we can call a fraudulent energy market. Uh, it is a, 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 um, the energy model in Europe um, uh, is be, has been defined by uh, decades of liberalization and privatization, and the the outcome of this is of this is the marginalistic pricing model, uh, which was created and allows uh, that uh, energy campaigns uh, might bid. Uh, the energy prices, and they can uh, then can, can sell cheap renewable energy at the price of expensive fossil fuels, and that was what was happening for a long, long time, and which generated uh, the crisis. Of course, this model uh, of uh, defining the prices of energy in Europe allows a lot of fluctuations and speculation with all kinds of windfall profits. And just uh, uh, like one year ago, we saw like uh, even this, the, BC, the ECB, sorry, uh, the European Central Bank uh, produced a report saying that the prices of energy more than the war or the inflation were a result of uh, uh, the profits, the excessive profits uh, that were being generated. But nevertheless, not much has been done. So we uh, act, act uh, in various dimensions, but especially trying to discuss this model of uh, market uh, for defining the energy prices and how we should and could change it uh, uh, from the European Union side. Of course, then we also touch upon the issues related with the profits, because while the people in Europe are struggling to, to make ends meet and pay their bills. And uh, there's a huge increase of energy poverty and people with difficulties. Uh, as, uh, as all of this is happening, uh, uh, the European gas companies made profits at least of uh, 4 billion euros during the first six months of 2021. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, then these uh, profits started uh, to increase even more. And so if we just keep the figures that we have for 2021, uh, we know that Shell recorded the highest profits in eight years, uh, like representing a 193% of increase uh, from when compared to 2020. So uh, this gives us a very uh, good picture about the contrast situation that we are living in Europe. As I said, where, where millions of people uh, live in energy poverty and precarity, and uh, they are not able even to properly or adequately heat and light their homes. Uh, and that means that, for instance, that uh, just before the crisis, before the rising of the crisis, we had already 80 million people in EU that were unable to pay their bills uh, uh, in 2019. So this has uh, increased a lot during COVID pandemic uh, uh, and the people were in their houses and they were inefficient. And uh, of course it uh, raised even more uh, after um, the, the, the crisis in the energy market prices started in October uh, 2021. So uh, we know that the electricity prices in Europe are regulated by a directive, uh, which is included in the common rules for internal markets for electricity. And uh, so uh, what, uh, what uh, we have now at the electricity pricing system 
is that it works on a common pay as you clear or marginal model, as I was saying. So our, one of our aims is that European institutions, uh, uh, governments work properly to change this model of market. And all the news we had till now, even some flexible measures which were presented by the commission and adopted, they don't touch in any moment the issue related uh, with the change of this directive and the way the prices are um, defined. So in our campaign, we have several demands and uh, uh, basically we are called power to the people. So meaning that Europe needs the democratic control of energy, that we need also to break the oligopolies of energy. And of course, at the same time, I try to accelerate a socially just climate transition. We are also uh, appointing as a demand to the change of the market, which I already spoke a lot. Uh, we uh, also claim that there is no room for climate justice without social justice, so that the transition from fossil fuels to renewables cannot be an excuse to maintain the power of the big corporations and that's to lead to a new model in which people and the planet and not the market are at the core of the policy solutions. And of course, the basis of all these energy as a right. So people uh, should not be in a position where they have to choose between heating their homes or eating at the end of the month. So uh, the, 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 we need to have short term measures that need to be taken into account in, in order to uh, allow people to both have money to eat and to heat their homes. So these are quite uh, the general lines of the campaign. Then we have developed several documents. We have published open editorials and several media. Uh, and also we have produced a 10 points uh, campaign challenges. Uh, and so I'm going to share with you because I see that already have passed the seven minutes. So I'm going to share with you in the chat both uh, the articles wrote by me and my two colleagues who coordinate the campaign and also the document with the 10 topics uh, uh, of our campaign that we have been working on. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marisa, for sticking to the time. Uh, we are very pleased to, to have you today. Uh, so we'll continue and give the floor to Josep Babot Barbero. Uh, Josep has a degree in law from the University of Barcelona, and he's member of the Alliance Against Energy Poverty, APE, and Engineering Without Borders, SAFE. Um, I have the doubt if we are having the interpretation solved at the moment, because otherwise, uh, maybe we have to ask um, Giuseppe to speak in English. Um, okay, Laia, uh, do you want to update us on how is the interpretation at the moment? Or yes, uh, okay. it's functioning correctly at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. So can I do it in Spanish then? Yeah, okay. Okay, um, yeah, as, as I said, I, I will do my presentation in, in Spanish and then we can solve any doubts or, or things that come up. So I've um, created some kind of small presentation and I will share it with you. Eh, perfecto, pues como ha explicado Mónica, yo soy José Pavot, formo parte de la Alianza contra la Pobreza Energética, que como sabéis y habéis oído en, en otras ponencias, somos un movimiento de base eh, y nos organizamos en asambleas abiertas eh, con familias directamente afectadas. Esto nos permite, pues, en muchos casos poder ver... Sorry, I'm going to sí. interrupt you because I'm hearing both Josep and Brian trans interpretation. Is it only me or everybody? Whatever. In my case, I'm in the Spanish channel and I'm only hearing Josep. Okay. I so hear maybe only Giuseppe. Spanish. Okay, because I'm on the English channel and I can hear both. 
But for me, it's not so difficult to understand Spanish. <laughs> Abajo a la derecha, Josep, donde pone interpretación, mm -hmm. clicar en español. ¿Y también? Sí, Josep, también. Vale, pues un momento, que dejo de compartir. A ver, eh, dejo de compartir, pues, que no me sale la opción. Bueno, si no, eh, ah, no, así, so así kind mejor. Of mention, you can switch off the original sound. If you go to English, you switch below. You switch off the original sound so that you can hear only the English interpretation. For me, it worked uh, wonderfully. Please check uh, this. Vale, sigo. Todo listo. como de energista. Vale, sí que voy oyendo voces por eso. Compartiré. Vale, eh, ahora sí, eh, empiezo de nuevo y si hay algún problema técnico, cortamos, ¿no? Espero, sí, todo bien, vale, perfecto. Eh, si hay algún problema técnico, me, me cortáis y lo intento en inglés eh, sin ningún problema, ¿vale? Bueno, como decía, muy rápido, para no intentarme ceñir en el tiempo establecido, eh, al ser un movimiento de base y poder realizar las asambleas abiertas, eh, esta, este hecho nos permite poder ver cuál es la aplicación práctica de las medidas que, que, va, que van aprobando las diferentes administraciones. Y eso nos permite pues, tener una idea clara de cómo las leyes y los reglamentos que las desarrollan luego se aplican en la práctica ¿no? eh, y qué impacto tienen en las familias. Entonces, habitualmente, creo que en, en otra de las sesiones que de, de este foro eh, vino aquí una, un alto representante ¿no? de, de uno de los ministerios de España. Eh, habitualmente, en este tipo de intervenciones se explican todas las cosas positivas ¿no? que ha hecho cada administración eh, y todas, pues lógicamente, todas la, la, las garantías de derechos que se han podido aprobar. Pero, lógicamente, cuando es la administración quien habla, nos explica cuáles son las carencias también de todas las medidas. Por tanto, en mi intervención intentaré explicar un poco cuáles han sido las principales medidas que se han aprobado a lo largo de los últimos tres años eh, en España en materia de pobreza energética y energía, eh, pero explicar también desde los dos lados eh, cuáles han sido, pero también cuáles han sido sus carencias justamente para eh, apoyar al, al, al tema de la, de la mesa de hoy, ¿no? que es estas soluciones. ¿Qué ha pasado en las familias y qué son estas soluciones que no han sido 100% efectivas? Así que queremos ver cómo estas soluciones pueden ser puestas en práctica de una manera efectiva. So I wanted, I wanted to do, uh, to actually bring in a meme, to bring in some, some sort of uh, humorous content. And then, so, so Anton Gurim has a Quinter, has a, has an account in Twitter and Instagram. And he talks about the question, practical questions of, of his daily life, which is, it looks so good, but then, you know, the, the reality is completely another thing. So here's some examples of what things that look really good, but, really don't work out so well. And so if you follow the, um, if, you, if you follow the rest of the presentation, you'll see um, these, are, these are some examples of things that, uh, and I wanted to just make, some, make it sort of more, more entertaining for you. And so let's look at what happened um, because of the pandemic and also through, throughout the, um, throughout the last couple of years. And some of these measures have are, are private prior to the pandemic and have been put into place since then. And then there's there was a, a massive prohibition on um, on uh, disconnections. But, but at the same time, I also want to explain about about what's happened with these with these uh, measures so that they so that they could be more effective. So for example, in the first, in the first, um, first situation, so you, so you can see the Spanish government actually created a, a ban on disconnections. In the and and then this was this was uh, full, carried out in the in the 
in the worst part of, of the COVID epidemic. And so they they put a moratorium on on um, on cuts on on disconnections. And then this was this was uh, carried out since March 2020 on electricity, gas, and water. And then up until now, they've they've continued extending these measures. And um, this this is something that we've we've been asking for a long time. And this was that this was basically um, taken out on on a trimester basis. And at, at the beginning of the pandemic, this moratorium was universal. It meant that uh, nobody nobody was was able to be cut cut off. And then now this moratorium only only goes out to those households who have a bono social, which is like a, a um, uh, basically they, they have to prove that they're vulnerable people. So there was a there was half a million uh, homes that were protected by this. This this, the, this is very positive, and but but what's the negative side? Why is this 100% effective? Because as I explained, the social bonus was this mechanism um, for against the cuts, which didn't didn't uh, reach all all, of, all the users. So a huge portion of the population can't actually keep their keep their home warm um, at the temperature that they'd enjoy. Um, and this is a this is a large portion in a, in a in a country of 47 million people. And according to the ministry, there would be as many as six million uh, houses that are in this situation. And so so an awful lot of people are not are not in this uh, category. At the same time, this this tool does not actually deal with the debt. So the so the people people accumulate a, a huge debt over the years, and um, this this debt is all, is also not is also affected by the by the increase in the prices in the energy prices, and so so there's all these families that are not protected. They 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 get all sorts of um, harassment from the companies. And they continue continue asking them to pay this debt. In the case of water and gas, this protection is not automatic. It has to it has to be retroactive. So the 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 clients have to actually send them send them um they send them a, a, an email and then they get they get a. Uh, it's it's not an automatic process. They have to send an email and go through bureaucracy, and then and then they, um, they this could this could actually mean that they they get their gas or water cut off um, because the system isn't automatic. And then there's another problem is that is that there's a there's a lack of practice to 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 get data on on the on the topic. We don't actually know since the since the pandemic started how many how many disconnections there have been. So we don't get information from the company about about which what what, uh, what cuts are actually happening because it's a private it's private information. <clears throat> the second the second measure that that uh, happened happened during the pandemic, but particularly since the the energy energy price crisis. Which is basically a disc, a discount on the electricity bill. Um, historically, this this discount was between twenty five and forty percent for those people who were in a category of, of vulnerable vulnerable people. And now, um, because of the because of the crisis in, in the prices, this 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 is rise up to 60, 65 to eighty percent. And as I explained before, they they go associated with uh, a prohibition in disconnections. And then this is this actually looks like a really good measure on paper. And they also they also allowed this uh, uh, electricity bonus of, of of energy justice, which is a new category, which is direct. Directed to those homes which have 
which have worked, but their salaries don't actually permit them to get to the end, end of the month. So it isn't only the, the most uh, preca precarious precarious uh, people, but even, even those precarious workers whose salaries aren't sufficient. But on the other side, on the negative side, this bono social, it requires a lot of paperwork and it, you have to give, give a lot of documents. And it means you have to give documents to the administration and to the company. And it, this this is a, a big workload, which which leads to the only of the six million of the households that are affected by energy poverty or heavily affected by energy poverty, that only 1.3 million have have been able to receive these benefits. Another another big but is that these these limits in the in the that, that there's a kilo, kilowatt hour limits on the on the consumption. This is that a lot of vulnerable households have really, really bad energy efficiency. And this means that, you know, they have old appliances and bad in, in, insulation. And this means that they, it leads to a lot of cold. So in a lot of cases, this limit on the kilowatt hours that they can use don't actually uh, help them because because this this associates with a regulated tariff that is associated with the wholesale price to the wholesale market and those so these mesas when the, fa the families that are that are have even though they have this bonus social they can they can have huge huge uh, bills like 200 euros a month. And the last problem with this social bono means that of a, a million and a half potential uh, households that could have could have gotten this this bono, only 2,300 households got this in the last three months. So this this happens when there, you you have a, a, pos a positive measure or measure that could be positive, but then isn't put into, into practice in a way that actually uh, that actually does does much benefit. So in the last, in the last uh, uh, issue that of, of these measures is the, the thermal social bonus. This is a direct payment, a, a direct account, in, uh, direct uh, deposit in the account for families with the electricity social bonus. This this annual um, this annual benefit, which is given to the families, comes from 80, 80, year, 80 euros to three hundred seventy three euros. And this depends on the climatic zone and their vulnerability. And so people that are in very vulnerable and very cold zones can, can get up to 400 euros in benefits. And some, some local governments, some regional governments have, have, have expanded this measure between 66 and 186 euros per year beyond what is already offered by the state. I'm not sure if this is really a positive measure because this is positive, this is public money which goes to private corporations. But at the same time, um, yet again, the problem of the bureaucracy um, causes, causes this measure to not, to not reach many people. And the real conditions of the people in the state, vulnerable families, don't have their 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 um, bill put into a bank account, and then they can't they can't actually pay they can't actually pay pay this bank account through through a a, um, a barcode, and this this means that they have to connect to internet, and many of them are actually not in the situation to do this. So this means that a lot of families don't have any right to to get this this benefit and yet again there's a complete lack of data uh, from these private companies to the to the public of of what's actually happening so this is a big hole in in what could be a very positive measure but it doesn't actually arrive to all the people that it it it, it should and for the last thing um No, I didn't understand that bit. Um, 
So let's let's look at this as a as a we should recognize this as positive, but it's not actually it may not actually be, which is there is a big big um, there's a big separation between. I didn't understand that. So this this ambiguous measure from the 31st of May to 2023 allows the wholesale market, just as the just as the Portuguese one. So the the they've saved five billion euros uh, to the to the consumers, but this has has led electric electricity prices to be lower than neighboring countries. Sorry, I, I'm I'm interrupting you for a second, which is that you have one minute left. And if you can speak a little bit slower for the interpreter, uh, thanks, Brian, for the effort. <laughs> Giuseppe speaks very fast. But yeah, please, only the last minute because we are running out of your time and a little bit slower for this last measure you're explaining. Thank you. Okay, so sorry, that's difficult because it's, I got to speak slower. And um, so, so this this was this was uh, last year, which it was um, from 2022 to 2023. This is a tax which intends to to take take the percent a percentage of the revenue of these large companies. And the big problem with this measure is that a lot of these uh, companies are funded funded by consumers and um, so so this this tax was funded by consumers and it wasn't assumed but it wasn't taken on by the companies and and therefore um, and this has led to a, a judicial war because the companies are trying to get out of paying this tax because they always do that and this Spanish tax has has bas basically uh, has seemed to to fit into the European normative, but this has led to an internal war, a judicial war. So thank you very much for your attention. Here you have my contact, and um, please. Let's try to understand the difference between between what is what you tr try to implement and then what the actual effects are, and what actually happens when this, these uh, measures are applied to the population, and keep them keep them very much in take them very much into account, so that um, so that we we have effective measures. Thank you so very much, Josep. Attention. Uh... We are, we are happy to have a, a critical view of the measures at Spanish level. So thanks for your inputs. Um, and we'll continue with uh, the rest of the speakers. Our next speaker is Gala Kabaj, Kabaj sorry, from Transform Europe, Paris. Gala Kabaj is facilitator of the working group Radical Far and Populist Right and member of the research collective Quantique Te Critique in France. She holds a master's degree in geography from La Sorbonne, and her work focuses on ecological movements. So the floor is yours, Gala, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for uh, having me. Thank you to the Right to Energy Coalition for organizing such a relevant and uh, interesting event and for inviting me. Um, so, as Monica said, um, I am facilitator for Transform, I am based in Paris, and I am also the co-founder of a research collective called Quantité Critique. Uh, this collective gathers sociologists and political scientists, and we focus on the analysis of social movements and on elections. And what will interest us today is our work on both the climate movement and the Yellow Vest movement uh, in France. So I'm not an expert of public policies or energy policies, but I, I specialize in uh, the analysis of these social movements with very simple question, uh, who mobilizes, uh, how do they mobilize and for which purpose? Uh, 
I believe that um, answering this question can help us anticipate and understanding the political risks uh, of governments uh, when they take wrong uh, responses to the energy crisis. Um, the data used for this presentation are data that we built uh, from surveys conducting in mobilizations uh, by questionnaires and interviews. So um, 2018 has been in France uh, for us who focus on social movements, a very interesting year because two massive and remarkable social movements emerged and both from an environmental question. Uh, the Yellow Vest movement started in November 2018 as a reaction um, to the tax carbon, a tax on gas paid by consumers. And the climate movement had started, had started a month before, so in October, in October uh, of course, influenced by a wider European uh, worldwide uh, movement, but the trigger in France was uh, the, um, the demission of the environmental minister, the Ministry of uh, Ecology. Uh, he resigned and the, the big protest in the streets uh, started. So these two movements shared a common political sequence because they happened in the same moment. And at this moment, the dominant rhetoric uh, spread by mainstream politics, mainstream media, uh, was to oppose this movement. Uh, the idea was to create an opposition between two social uh, antagonist words, two social and ideological blocks, uh, sometimes even two Frances, uh, the friends of urban uh, upper classes that defend ecology, and on the other side, uh, the rural popular classic that defends uh, a lifestyle with cars that defend industry. Uh, so the idea was really to oppose them as if they were uh, one against the other. So the first question is why uh, this rhetoric has been spreading? What is credible in uh, this rhetoric? The first point is that Theoretically, uh, this idea um, coincides with post-materialist theories that are quite common, um, according to which values such as ecology would only be the question of in individuals freed from material constraints. Um, that brings the idea of a structural opposition of popular classes to ecology because they could only focus on material issues. From a sociological point of view, uh, this idea, this opposition between these two blocks finds a confirmation uh, in a very specific uh, and distinct uh, social compositions of the movement. I will be very uh, brief on the social comp composition, so don't uh, be too hard on me because I don't have much time, but just to, to, to try to give you um, an overview of this very distinct social composition. The climate movement was uh, a movement of uh, upper classes, but not all the upper classes. It was a very specific sector of the upper classes, meaning that executive workers, but from not all the sectors, the sectors of activity that were present in the mobilization were the sectors of the culture, of the research, of the education. We didn't find executive work workers from the bank, from insurance, the sector were, were absent. So upper classes, but a specific part of them. They live in major cities and politically they are anchored in the left and the radical left of the political spectrum. Also, we noticed an overrepresentation of women in uh, the protests. The social composition of the Yellow Vest movement was quite different, mainly workers, employees, uh, with a clear gender divide um, regarding the sectors of activity. The sector most represented of women, yellow vest, was the sector of the care. Um, and the men uh, sector most represented was the sector of logistics. 
These two sectors have in common to be marked by a strong fragmentation of work groups um, and a very high uh, recourse to temporary contracts, uh, causing workers, of course, to precarity, but also to become highly uh, dependent of the car. This dependence is redoubled by the fact that uh, the yellow vest mostly live in rural and suburban areas. Politically, uh, the, yellow vest, the yellow vest movement was more heterogeneous uh, than the climate movement, but it's uh, actually as heterogeneous as the popular classes are. Uh, to say it quickly, uh, if we analyze their vote in 2017 general election, we find three blocks, the abstention, uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon and Marine Le Pen. So this rhetoric uh, contains uh, soci sociological realities, of course, but we have to overcome uh, this opposition between the two movements because it tends to erase uh, several elements and not to seize the political opportunity that has emerged from the coexistence of these two social movements that happened in the same time. And we wish to challenge this opposition. Why? Because there were actually attempts of conversions uh, to make these two movements uh, actually um, gather. Uh, they, they existed this um, yeah this um, willing to to converge. Um, it was carried by a majority of both the movements. Um, of course, this um, was locally and episodic, but. This came to the establishment of the slogan, end of the month, end of the world, same fight. And this embodies the desire not to be opposed. Then um, if the yellow vest or even the working class uh, as a whole are relatively absent from the mobilization for climate, this, this does not allow us to assume that they are opposed to ecology. Um, if the fact of mobilizing in reaction to the tax carbon was interpreted as such, uh, we wanted to question uh, the yellow vest relation to ecology. So the first result we obtained is that there is no opposition within the um, to climate movement. There is no opposition to ecology in the yellow vest movement. When we asked them, uh, about the eminence of an ecological catastrophe if things continue in the same way, there are more than 83% to agree with this. 7% uh, to not answering the question, which leaves only 9% of climate skepticism, which is actually a score similar to the general population. So the yellow vests are not more opposed to ecology as general population. Secondly, uh, we asked during interview is if the opposition to tax was an opposition to ecology. And we actually discovered a very constructed, uh, very built counter argument within the movements being built on the following pillars. The first one, the most uh, uh, common was, this is fiscally and socially unfair. The second one was we 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 have problem of we have economic constraint and we lack a room for maneuver and you the gov government can uh, give us more constraint with this tax. Uh, the third one was the political class is not exemplary in terms of ecology. Why should we be? Uh, the third one, uh, the first one was ter territorial inequality. Uh, we don't have access to public transportation, um, urban people have, but we don't have uh, the luxury to take the public transportation. We have to take the car. Um, and the, the last one, but not the least, was a demand for a stronger democratic framework, which means that we, are, we agree to have political constraint, but it has to be demanded democratically. In this question, only 2% 2% of the responses had climate skepticism argument. So the mobilizations are quite different politically, sociologically, 
uh, we did not attend a massive convergence between the movements, but most, both movements made the other one evolve. Uh, the climate movement abandoned, abandoned very quickly the concept of individual changes for systemic, systemic demands. And this is thanks to the, climate, to the Yellow Vest movement. Uh, and the Yellow Vest movement expressed a will for ecology with the condition that it is democratically decided uh, and is insisted on the fiscal uh, social justice, refusing to, to be the one that carry uh, the weight uh, of the ecological uh, responsibility. So this is what um, the sociology of the, cli of the climate and Yellow Vest uh, movement teaches us. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Gala. This was very enlightening uh, to have your views on yeah, the Gilles Jaune and the pro-climate demonstrations in France. So thanks, thanks for your contribution. We'll continue with our next and last panelist, who is Andrea Masullo. He is Professor Emeritus of Fundamentals of Sustainable Economy. He's a scientific director of the international organization Green Accord, and he has been expert consultant of Ministry of Environment on waste management, circular economy, energy, and climate adaptation planning. Thanks a lot, Andrea, for being here, and the floor is yours. You need to unmute yourself. Uh, we can't hear you at this moment now it's okay, okay. thank okay. you yes thanks to you for this invitation i will uh, give you a short uh, uh, comment to uh, of uh, uh, the uh, uh, pol policy uh, uh, energy policy of the new government um, uh, this government uh, uh, continues to uh, on the, the initiatives of the former governments about an important initiative in Italy, uh, the constitution of energy, uh, renewable energy communities. Uh, this uh, initiative uh, uh, started with a great uh, 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 movement in, uh, in people because uh, uh, the, the constitutional community uh, can uh, allow people to afford the, the increasing of uh, the cost of energy and to put together uh, uh, um, uh, all the improvement of uh, their uh, own domestic cons consumes uh, with a, a, a monitoring in real time and the government, uh, the, the former governments, uh, uh, decided to give uh, uh, a support, economical support, uh, um, uh, about uh, the difference of the low cost of self-production and self-consumption, uh, uh, respect to uh, the um, uh, average cost of energy in the national grid. And so uh, they pay the, uh, the, the, the compensation of the problem that an, uh, an energy not continue like photovoltaic solar energy can uh, give to the, uh, to the national grid. And so they, the compensation is uh, proportional to the self consume. The monitoring the real time uh, 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 give uh, also information to people to uh, uh, improve their efficiency in, uh, in uh, their consumes and to uh, install new uh, plants of uh, uh, new photovoltaic plants. Uh, it's very interesting because uh, the compensation will be spent in a free way between people that agree to the community. Uh, so they can spend in uh, improving their uh, life the, of their territory uh, or uh, uh, for social uh, uh, purposes. So it's uh, 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 had a great success, but, but <laughs> there is a problem. Uh, uh, the former government and the uh, uh, 
present government hasn't yet uh, uh, gave the regulation decree to uh, uh, connect these communities to the grid. So we are waiting and uh, there has been only, only a draft decree but the authority must give the regulation to connect to the grid. Uh, this is for uh, the uh, past to the present. Now, the first step of uh, uh, the new government, the, Me the Meloni government, uh, um, has uh, yes, continued on the track of the last decade, decades to leave the national strategies to be driven by the national company, ANI, founded, you know, uh, 70 years ago uh, by Enrico Mattei to defend Italy from the enormous power of the so-called uh, Big Oil Seven Sisters, and, and he paid with his own life for this initiative. But at present, ANI continue on its core business with scarce attention to climate change mitigation goals. Today, the government has uh, uh, really an, uh, uh, an unclear position on European climate strategies. Some prominent representatives of the right-wing coalition declared that the EU Commission strategies are drawn on ideological grounds and doesn't fit for the Italian national interests. This is a big, could be a big problem. The projects uh, to be financed by the EU for South Italy, originally based on transport infrastructures, highways, re uh, rail systems, and sea freight, uh, with the new government rapidly shifted to energy, renewables and fossils. And with the recent visit in Algeria of the Premier Meloni and then President Descalzi, signed an agreement for delivering natural gas to Italy to make out our country a gas hub, hub for all Europe. Meloni declared that this will make energy supply for Italy and Europe safe and more independent. It is hard to realize how making Italy uh, and Europe relying on another political hot area will create more stability in the energy uh, supply. Furthermore, this strategy needs investment in a big gas pipeline that will risk to be used for half of its potential life to reach the 2030-55% GHG re reduction and the carbon neutrality by 2050. It will be necessary to plan also the reduction of gas use. Meanwhile, the Commission is preparing uh, within next March new ambitions for renewable, uh, maybe 40% goal in 2050. And the South Italy, that is one of the most favorite region for solar energy, should have a great advantage establishing photovoltaic factories. But the biggest opportunity that makes Italy one of the most favorite region in the world is geothermal energy that is so abundant to make Italy potentially independent and also able to export electricity. Enel has uh, 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 the experience and the knowledge to use liquid, liquid reservoir in uh, Tuscany that cover the 2% of total national energy demand. But all the Apennines chain from north to the south, including Sicily, has a potential of 500 mega tons of oil equivalent. It's an enormous quantity. Uh, the 300% thir of total national demand. And this forever. This is renewable. Uh, if, if we consider also the dry rocks at more than 100 degree, oh, and, and all this reservoir is uh, from uh, uh, 3,000 to uh, 5,000 meters deep underground. Uh, so it's easy to be 
reached by uh, with the knowledge of any of uh, that has this all the long experience in uh, hydrocarbons and oil extraction. If we consider the dry rock at more than 100 uh, Celsius degrees existing in the same area between 3,000 and 5,000 meters deep, extracting the heat, creating an artificial circulation as is, is it made uh, all over the world in many countries from United States to Iceland and other regions, uh, Japan, um, the potential will be <laughs> here, 9,000 times the national energy demand. And he has the knowledge to exploit this enormous resource, making Italy total independent, also using electricity to produce hydrogen for industries and for rail transport. And see freight, uh, all this potentially, potentiality will allow Italy to uh, reach early the carbon neutrality before 2050. Um, but uh, Maloney and Annie prefer to make business with fossil fuels. This is uh, a problem for, uh, for Europe because you know that the United States, the uh, 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 federal government of US uh, is uh, about to uh, launch uh, a, a, a great, very great plan of, uh, to finance uh, the energy transition for renewable energies, supporting their industries. Because the, uh, the, uh, the policy of these great investments are uh, uh, um, for the national uh, federal government. And uh, you know how much the oil sector and uh, coal sector influence United States policies and the election of presidents. If this plan will be implemented, it means that in the next uh, uh, years, the next decades, uh, the United States policy will really change and the competition with Europe will be very uh, great because Europe is not joined together in energy policies. Every country want to do what is uh, in continuity with Andrea, microphone. your microphone is off. And don't put together uh, uh, the great resources that are in Europe. So we need a, a real, really uh, common policy to, uh, in which each country will give the great uh, resources that uh, domestic resources that he has. Uh, the, the same is, uh, uh, for example, uh, French. I heard uh, about French. Uh, fr France. France has uh, uh, an, a, a, a great use of nuclear power, but they, it needs to uh, the, this 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 assembling of, of it, and they need great capital to spend to close this experience and try to have advantage uh, uh, to, to not uh, uh, change uh, too much on this ground. Uh, and uh, uh, Germany uh, has a problem with the coal, as uh, the same Poland. We have to uh, make, uh, to give the, the opportunity to uh, uh, European community to draw the energy policies to consider all these differences, but to put together all the opportunities, each country with their own resources. We need really the transition to uh, a regional uh, uh, approach, regional planning approach in which every region will put uh, together uh, the, uh, their resources, not to have uh, uh, regional interests regional uh, ecological approach, like energy communities. Everything use what uh, they have on uh, under the, their uh, feet and over their head. But I see that there is uh, it's too poor what is inside their head because everything thinks 
to his own interests. And so uh, uh, the uh, uh, European policies, energy policy risk to uh, uh, be uh, delayed by this uh, uh, single, single domestic interests. I finished. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you so much. Um, I think now with the four interventions, we have quite a lot of examples of false solutions, also uh, ways in which the most vulnerable or minorities are being blamed or are carrying a majority of the weight of this overlap crisis um, or even attacks to uh, social policies or public services, of course, in the in the sector of energy, um, which is the one that <laughs> is uh, interesting for us at this Right to Energy Forum. So we will continue with the debate. Uh, now we are opening the floor uh, for everybody. Uh, we only have seen one question on the chat, which is for Giuseppe, um, but I don't know if, first of all, someone is willing to um, share a question. We will recommend to open your camera so that we can see everybody. And it, it's a more, more personal uh, and close <laughs> uh, discussion. So are there any questions? And in the meantime, maybe Giuseppe, you can have a look to to the question that was sent to you uh, about the debts that people is accumulating. Someone wants to take the floor from the audience. Can I just to break the ice? Roberto Morea, Transform Europe, uh, I'm based in Italy, but. Go ahead, yes, thank you. Uh, well, uh, as an, uh, Andrea already said, we need uh, to have uh, also a European uh, plan to sort out this uh, situation on the energy crisis. And I just wondering if there is a plan, uh, because uh, uh, we heard now a national uh, response to uh, to this uh, crisis that we live uh, uh, at national level, and we respond, we answer differently. In, I mean, uh, we, we also have in Italy this preeminent role of the uh, industry sector or uh, factories. Uh, the private company are benefit from our state. Uh, to confront this situation and to to help them, but not the real people. Uh, um, this the money goes to the uh, private sector and uh, and and that's all. Uh, so I I just want to know if also at the European level uh, we are oh, there is a plan to reshape our uh, gas dependency and uh, not only substituting uh, the, the pipeline from the north to the south, that's the, what is designing until now. So it's just a question. I don't know the answer now, right now because I, I'm not an expert in this and so, is just my question. Thank you, thank you, Roberto. Um, yeah, let's let's take several questions at the same time. I see Juan Carlos uh, has also raised his hand, and please, uh, if I miss any of the hands for a reason, tell me. Sí, hola, buenos días. Eh, preguntar en español, aprovecho. Eh, Juan Carlos de la Federación Belga de Servicios Sociales. Okay, I'm Juan Carlos from the Federation of Federation. So, can, can you explain a little bit more, Roberto? Uh, 
sobre, sobre beneficios. Can, can you, ¿Cuáles han sido las discusiones un poco detrás? Eh, sabía que quizás no era compatible con el marco europeo. Explain, eh, uh, what are the, the eh, situations behind this and, and this um, tax on the bank, which has which has been created? Is it the same uh, same argument? Is there some? I'd, I'd like to know no more. Sorry, I didn't get that far enough. Ah, uh, perdón, Juan Carlos, que has hablado un poco rápido. You spoke a little bit fast, and I don't know if you sent the question to to Jose. Can you write it in the chat. Can you write your question in the chat? Okay. Yeah. If in the meantime, if in the meantime you can write it on the chat, and we continue okay. with other questions. Uh, so now we have. Uh, or I can say it in English. Would you prefer? Uh, I think I think it's okay. It. I th we we will have it in the chat, and and Josep will sure answer to that. So we have the the question of Roberto that I think uh, Marisa can can sure answer we, from the EU so perspective. We have Roberto's question, I think Marisa can answer from from the perspective. From her perspective. Yeah, shall I answer now? Or? We yeah, I think we have three questions now. Uh, two. Okay that have gone to, to Josep and one that I, I'm okay. sure you can answer so you can start. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, from, um, from um, uh, what I was trying to explain in the beginning um, uh, and also believing there's a huge role to be played with the energy communities and of course in the member states at national level, and, uh, and we do believe all of us that's a, a key uh, dimension of all this uh, process. Um, so uh, I really enjoy the presentations after the one I, I made uh, because they put the emphasis on, on those dimensions. But as I was trying to say in the beginning, the campaign we have is mainly and basically trying to also uh, move uh, to what can we do at European level together. So uh, in the line of what uh, Roberto was uh, asking, I mean, we really understand uh, the importance of the local, the national, and of course, of the control of the energy, the public control, all these issues, which we defend are, uh, and we support are, uh, at the core of uh, of what we need to do, but within the campaign, uh, we and that's why I talk a lot about the energy markets because we try to see from our collective perspective what can we do uh, together in order than to enable that these transformations are made. So uh, uh, we, all, all the measures we present uh, uh, in this campaign uh, have to do with something that we can do at European level. So not only uh, the, to, to, to change the market rules, as I said, but also at the European level, as a plan, we can have a cap in energy prices. Uh, and that's something which was not uh, properly done yet. There were some exceptions, but there's a measure that we can do at uh, the European all, uh, level. And also we think that it would be much more effective to tax window for windfall profits of the big energy companies uh, uh, at a common level. I mean, we are talking about international uh, corporations and uh, and uh, uh, if we would have a proper uh, common approach to that, it could be a good, uh, a good, um, uh, a good intervention from the European side. Also, um, we think that in a common basis, we can define and guarantee a minimum uh, vital energy supply. Uh, we have huge differences as a lot in terms of uh, uh, inequalities and spe specificities of all countries, but uh, as a common principle, we could define there is a level, a minimum level of supply that could be defined for all, and then we could have a solidarity model in order to guarantee that. Uh, also, there were already measures to have energy saving plans. Um, we all heard uh, Borrell, uh, the vice president of the commission, saying, okay, people, that they should 
disconnect uh, their energy supply at home and talking especially to the most vulnerable people, those who already just use the energy they can pay and not even all the energy they need. So we would have to put the emphasis on the savings on the other side and not to put pressure, even more pressure on those which are, who are already so much uh, pressured. Um, and then there are other measures linked to the uh, uh, energy, renewables energy uh, systems. Uh, uh, there are uh, several dimensions in several countries that can be really explored and then it could somehow, as it was said just now by Andrea, uh, the capacity of Italy to produce energy, renewable energy from thermal uh, sources is huge and much more than it, if it would be developed that the country needs. So we can also work on these uh, renewables energies uh, um, capacity and also have uh, some plans. And then of course, uh, we have to uh, think about other concrete measures like we are working now in a very key measure to fight energy poverty, which is the energy efficiency uh, uh, of the buildings, the energy performance and to tackle the worst performing buildings and try to have common measures in order to answer that. I have to say that we had a very good proposal from the parliament, from the, the rapporteur. I was the shadow rapporteur from the left group, but the rapporteur from the Greens, he had a very good initial proposal, uh, and not only with environmental and climate concerns, but also with a lot of social concerns. And throughout the negotiations, it was a little bit watered down because of the pressure from the right wing. And uh, at the end of the negotiations, especially from the pressure of uh, uh, Georgia Meloni's uh, government. Um, so we had this alliance between the EPP and the ECR trying to avoid to have a proper and concrete directive dealing with the energy performance of the buildings and which we think is a crucial element because we know that the buildings represent not only 21% of the emissions, but also uh, that uh, uh, we have a, a huge percentage of the buildings in the bad, bad conditions with not any condition to save energy. And it's not only about the emissions, it's also about the waste of energy because of the lack of uh, efficiency of the buildings we are living in. So, uh, okay, sorry, it's a kind of a list, but I think that we can have, and we should also have a new European plan as it was said by Roberto, we can have it and we should have it. Uh, that doesn't reduce the, import the importance of the local approach of the energy communi communities, of the role of the countries and the member states, especially if we think that the energy is a right and should be a public good. So of course, uh, the role of the states and the local uh, communities is, is really important. Thank you, Marisa uh, and Giuseppe. Uh, if you want to answer to the question uh, was raised on the debt that people is accumulating, if it is canceled or if people has to pay it, uh, that would be bring also lots of elements to the session. Sí, eh, si os parece bien, responderé a la, a la pregunta sobre las deudas y también a la que... Okay, if you think, I'll answer the question about the debts. I'll go a little bit slower. In the first place, about the, doubt, the debts, the answer to this question, is that the, the households which are protected by from from these cuts from this connection they they are not that doesn't solve their their debt problem and they and they the companies keep uh, sending them bills and the government uh hasn't hasn't actually provided any solutions to this, to this issue so the only debt that has been canceled are on those Households which have a, um, a bonus social and those which have um, those which have minors in, in in the household. Everybody else, any any household without my, 
miners um, and it continues continues accumulating a debt unless they have uh, a social bonus. And then in Catalonia, we have our own situation because we have our own law. And so asking about the tax question that Juan Carlos asked, uh, I've read some some revisions about uh, some some reviews about this, and uh, related to how the Spanish government decided to uh, I didn't know the this. They they tried. They tried to um, do sort of uh, financial engineering to, to do a, a lot of economic purposes by going with Spain, to pay less, um, that actually if they just simply tax on the profits, which are not so easy to hide. So this has been the decision of the government. And of course, this will give the, the tribunals a lot of a lot of uh, leeway in, in order to decide. And so I have a lot of worry about about this because the large Ex energy companies are experts in basically getting around any sort of uh, law and then taking it to the to the tribunals. And in fact, they almost always get um, they always always get given um, they always get get what they want in, in the court court of law. And you have to look for. Uh, you have to look for, you have to be very careful when you look for any sort of um, legal tactics to fight these companies because they have so much power. They have the best, the best um, lawyers, they have, they, and they have, they take everything, all this uh, to the, the tribunals and have to pay. Okay, uh, only one, one, one small detail, I think. Brian, when you are interpreting, uh, we, we can hear some noises on the back. So I don't know if you can, maybe you're moving or touching something, but I we couldn't hear very, very well uh, the, the interpretation. Also because Giuseppe is a fast speaker, but thank you. Thank you so much for the answer. And I will, uh, yeah, Juan Carlos is very happy with your answer. <laughs> um, so I will let uh, Roland uh, bring some other questions to the other panelists that haven't answered yet. If we can yeah, bring more elements, thanks. Yeah, hi. Um, I would like to take up uh, the issue um, Gala was talking about. Um, Gala, from my perspective, being in Brussels uh, and looking uh, to, to, to France, and we, if we talk about uh, the energy crisis for the people, but obviously also for the planet and the political dangers, and you mentioned the uh, Yellow Wests. My question is, um, do we know what uh, Macron would do if he would have the place to do uh, in regard to supporting people and also if there are plans from uh, Le Pen's uh, really right wing, uh, how she would protect people or not as a political danger. If, if there's anything uh, from your side, what, what maybe you, you would know. That would be my question, Gala, to you and then to Andrea. My question would be if you would uh, like to follow up Roberto's uh, question uh, to the EU level, which you started, and then what Marisa added to this, if you would also like to share your thoughts on this. So, Gala, if you would like to uh, say something. Thanks, Roland, for your question. Um, what I can say is that uh, ecology has been, in few few years, has become consensual. 
uh, climate skepticism is quite minoritary in the society and political leaders have understood it, uh, such as Le Pen and, and Macron. Um, they did not turn into ecologists. Uh, what they did is that they invested ecology uh, with their ideological background to, um, how to say, to, to, to promote their uh, political ideology. So in the case of Macron, uh, it's the defense of the free markets. So he, he created, not him, I mean the liberal, created a kind of ecology that um, is coherent with the ideology of free markets. So it gives birth to the idea that innovation and technology are the solution. Um, it's what we call techno-modernism, -modern that the solutions is in capitalism. Um, there are a lot of person in the society who believes that uh, it's mostly uh, voters of Emmanuel Macron. It's a group of upper classes that vote for Macron, sometimes for the green um, engineers. Uh, yeah, upper classes, mostly male. It's very interesting to see how this ideology is gender divided, this idea that yeah, new technology innovations uh, can support uh, the climate um, transition. In the case of Le Pen, uh, she invested ecology. Uh, she took time, but she did it. Uh, and the idea was to go back to um, racist uh, ideology. So the idea is that what she does with ecology is to protect uh, the landscapes, to protect the terroir, uh, protect, um, yeah, the, the, the landscape protection is really uh, a thematic in ecology that lies in the far right. And we saw it during the general campaign. Uh, one of the most, one of the only actually proposition for ecology of both Macron and uh, Eric Zemmour was to destroy um, the wind turbines. Uh, this was the ecological proposition that they made uh, because uh, they wanted to protect the landscape. So the, the um, far right way to invest ecology is a, in a very local uh, dimension. Uh, with the idea that a uh, wave of migration would destroy the landscape and the local ecosystems. So this is very interesting to see that they did not refuse to invest ecology. They used it to promote their, um, uh, their ideology and did not move on their ideology. Uh, so this is yeah very interesting to, to, to see. Uh, thanks a lot, Gala. Uh, this is really interesting because we have the same phenomenon in Germany uh, with this kind of landscape thing. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, now, Andrea, um, um, as we have only a very short time left, uh, Andrea, if you would like to say something, please take the floor. Oh, yes, uh, rapidly. The real game is between centralized uh, energy and distributed energy. Centralized means that we can take resources everywhere in the world to put where you have a, a big plant and to do it. Now, the real game is this. We have to pass rapidly to match all the goals uh, uh, for uh, climate protection uh, to distributed energy, integrated with uh, uh, some uh, renewable uh, uh, plants of big power to maintain the continuity of the production of intermittent uh, energies like solar and wind, and so integrated the uh, 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 European policy on this uh, uh, great turning point. Transition is not enough. It, we need a revolution of the model. And just uh, only starting from the uh, local resources, we can solve the problem. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Andrea. Very, very clear, very direct. Um, only one minute left. We are very happy that, uh, yeah, we have created, I think, a very uh, nourishing debate and that we are trying uh, to have a real, like a real just transition and not only a transaction, uh, which is not solving real people's 
and planet problems and urgencies. Um, so thank you, you all for the contributions. Um, we will be very attentive on all the political uh, current uh, movements. Uh, and yeah, we are willing to share with you more inputs in other sessions. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Brian, for the interpretation. I want to thank you, the four panelists, uh, giving us all these different views from you point of view, but also some member states' uh, perspectives, which is very enlightening. Um, and thank you also, Roland and Transform Europe, to co-organize this session. And of course, um, the Right to Energy Coalition and all the colleagues at the back doing invisible work with logistics and everything. So I hope to see you in the next sessions. Thank you all and have a nice day. Oh, Wiedersehen. Schönen Tag noch. Bye, bye.